Okay, sir. Shall we get started? Mohana Charyu, sir. Yes, madam. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am happy to welcome to sixth day international workshop on research methodology. As you know, Vijnan Foundation for Science, Technology and Research initiated research activities on campus. And uh, the objective of this research methodology workshop is to enlighten all the scholars in and outside the campus to have a kind of awareness among uh, the research community, the process of research and the objectives of that. Keeping that in the mind, uh, uh, we invited uh, 10 resource persons out of which today is the sixth one, uh, Professor Prakash Korna Sarazan with us. We are very happy and welcome, sir. Thank and, you, thank you, sir. Thank you. So uh, much. We are very happy to associate such an eminent scholar with us uh, and who enlighten and who encourage us. Uh, I am very happy to inform all the participants that Prakash Konasar is our board of research member and also uh, a member of our staff selection committee, also from the Department of English. With this brief one, I would like to invite our um, Professor Sharda, Madam, head of the department, who initiated and encouraged all the faculty of the department to organize this kind of workshop. I would like to invite Professor Sharda, Madam, to have a welcome address today's yeah. workshop. Over to Professor Sharda, Madam. Thank you very much, Professor Mohna Charilu. On behalf of um, our department, I extend a warm welcome to our resource person for today's session, Dr. Prakash Kona. I know his scholarship, so uh, you will all shortly be listening to his, uh, his erudite lecture. But more importantly, he's a very good human being, a very genuine person. And on the campus of FLU, he's uh, known as a godfather for many who has nurtured young students and supported them through their research journey. So both uh, you, uh, all UG, PG, PhD scholars, all of them speak very highly of him. And he has done very responsible positions, different positions in the university, but he has always been a very, very friendly uh, uh, faculty member to the students. And students remember him very fondly. Some of his students also work with us. That is how I know. Okay, what a warm and fine person he is. So um, it is an honor and privilege for us to have Professor Prakash Kona with us today. And I really thank him for sparing his time and for showing willingness to share his scholarship with all of us. Thanks, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank and, you, Sharada. Uh, thank you, thank mm -hmm. you, Prakash. And this uh, research methodology workshop was envisaged as a uh, course for our research scholars. And we thought that when our scholars are going to be listening to such eminent people, why not share this platform with the rest of uh, the scholars uh, in the country, in the rest of the country as well. And we also have a large number of faculty members also who are also in their uh, scholarly pursuits to write research papers. All of them are joining us today. I once again extend a warm welcome to all the participants who have been very active and who have uh, shared their thoughts, ideas, and uh, posing a lot of questions during the Q&A. So I'm sure that today's session will be very enlightening, and I look forward to listening to Professor Prakash Kona. Thank you, Professor Mohna Charilu, for giving me this opportunity. Over to you, sir. Thank you, madam. Thank you very much. Uh, as a part of our uh, initiation of the research program, uh, it is uh, uh, the responsibility of our research scholars to submit a report on what happened for the last six days. Today, I invite Mr. Arshad, research scholar, Department of English, and he will submit a brief report of our workshop in a nutshell. Over to Mr. Arshad. Mr. Arshad, are you online? Hello, sir. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Good evening, all. Uh, my name is Arshad. Uh, I'm a full-time research scholar, English department, Vignan University. First of all, uh, thank you so much, uh, so much for having me here. 
So this is a summative report of the five days of workshop uh, that we done so far. On the first day, uh, deliberated by Dr. Venkat Reddy, he used a directive approach for the scholars to reflect on certain crucial aspects, like what is research, how to select a research topic, the significance of literature review, among a few others. The second session was taken by Dr. D. Raj Gobal, who delivered to talk on research design and approaches to inquiry. Dr. V. Sudhagar gave a lecture on 10th December for the third round of this session. His talk focused on the theories of psycholinguistics and how it can be utilized in the field of language teaching. Professor Anoma Satra Singh presented on the fourth day of the workshop uh, on the 11th December. The thrust of her lecture was on the practical implications of research work for a scholar. Yesterday, the fifth session was undertaken by Dr. Sami Babu from Jamia Millia University. The topic was uh, research documentation and he gave some excellent uh, guidelines with regard to the structure of the research work, sources uh, for literature review, how to develop a new research problem while referring to similar research works in the given area. The focus there was on identifying the gaps in the filling in the through discussion. Also, he talked about the academic culture of the country, the ethical considerations and economic parameters to be kept in mind, the things to be included in research document and the different style sheets available for referencing. A lot of thrust was given on substantiating the study through advocate work citation. Finally, in the question and answer round, a number of uh, doubts expressed from the participants and uh, were clarified by the speaker. Thank you. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Arshad. Good evening to all. Uh, uh, now I request our faculty member, uh, Ms. Devaki, to initiate today's proceedings and act as a moderator by giving a brief profile of today's resource person. Over to Devaki. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, if you don't mind, we'll skip that part later. You'll, we can discuss it. Eh? Huh? No, sir. It is just only for one minute as uh, the formality of uh, respecting the resource person. Maybe it is your... It's okay, man. I'm sure you respect <laughs> me, man. You know? <laughs> one minute only. One minute, not okay. more than that. We will not take sure. too much time. Too much time. Okay, okay. Over to the Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, Good evening, all. It's my privilege to introduce our speaker today. Professor Prakash Konaradi is an Indian novelist, essayist, poet, and theorist who lives in Hyderabad, India. He is an alma mater of University of Mississippi, University of Hyderabad, and Usmania University. At present, he is at IFLU. He has been members of many boards at different universities. At present, he is also a board of studies member and a panelist of staff selection committee in Vignan's Jim Tibri University. He completed his doctoral study on a comparative analysis of Derrida, Chomsky, and Wittgenstein from the University of Mississippi, MS, in 1997. He has worked on Marxism, history of anarchism, the avant garde poetry, third world resistance writing, and polemical cinemas. In addition to this, his research, his area of interest includes Shakespeare, postcolonialism, world literature, and Afro-American literature. He has published numerous articles and books, 36 of which can be assessed from Academia website. Some of his most well-known works include Conjure of Nights, How I Invented Myself as Prakash Kona, Words on Lips of a Stranger, Pearl of an Unstrung Nectars, Literary Criticism, A Study of Pluralisms, Streets that smell of dying roses, poems for her, you and other poems, other works including essays and fictional wing ads are published widely on the internet. Having said so, I would now like to hand over this question to Prakash sir for our today's deliberation. Thank you so much for accepting the invitation sir. Over to you. Thank sir. you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, man. One second. Uh, okay, man, you know, you know, you see, when we think of uh, any research, we are thinking of the uh, pursuit of truth, you know, you know, that thing we have to remember, that's the bottom line, you know, you know, you know. You see, that when we talk of research, we are talking about the pursuit of truth. You know. One is, don't forget, man, we are adding a re to the Search. No, no, no. In other words, 
mm, unlike uh, the usual uh, kind of uh, dictum that uh, you are expected to be original you know you know you know you know you the burden of originality is not on the researcher definitely not on the researcher it is on the creative writer is it is it that the creative writer has to be original is it is it not the researcher you are researching you know that is a beauty about research you know you are not looking for the uh, first foundation you know you know, you know you know what happened in the beginning you know, you know, you know, you know. that is not your job you know, you know. you are researching you are relooking you know, in other words or rethinking about an issue is it so that is the thing we have to remember man, that there is no end to research you know, you know, you know, you know. it's an unending uh, quest you know it is like that search for that fountain of eternal youth or or that quest for that Uh, thing that can change everything into gold and things like that you know we have all these stories you know you know search for el dorado or this imaginary land where uh, everything is uh, gold you know, you know you know this land of gold you know that that kind of a thing you know? i'm only g- giving a vague metaphor huh? but the point is that you know, you know at any point uh, someone will be able to add a perspective or an idea to the existing body of knowledge you know, you know there's no doubt about that you know it's an absolute fact of life you know, you know. so this conventional notion uh, of the creative writer uh, who emerges out of nowhere and produces a lot of great stuff uh, may not be entirely Uh, accurate you know, you know what is closer to the truth is that creative writers are also part of a social milieu they function within that existing sociology of knowledge and they use those resources in order to uh, be creative you know, you know. Mm-hmm. among those sources we have to accept the role of historians researchers and uh, others you know, you know other ordinary people who are trying to think carefully about an issue you know, you know, you see, you see. so there are a lot of uh, people who are involved you know you look at plagiarism the whole idea of plagiarism is you are not supposed to uh, copy anything verbatim you know? you're not supposed to do it because it's unethical you know not to mention illegal you know? it's unethical to do it but um, when it comes to ideas uh, we cannot expect originality uh, from all research scholars you know it's impossible you know, you know, you know, you know. scholars are not expected to be uh, original in that sense you know. they look they explore they take an existing idea they explore it give it a context examine the situations around it and uh, in certain cases they'll use quantitative methods to ascertain whether this idea makes sense within this situation or not you know, you know, you know. so that kind of thing we have to remember you know, you know, you know. that basically uh, the research scholar is is uh, trying to figure out the relevance of something you know so that is your job as a research scholar but of course man, we have to look at it as a practical activity and like my uh, my point always is uh, i mean you have to sort of memorize this uh, research scholarship is
is indistinguishable from research writing. Unfortunately, I cannot say this may be true of all humanities or social sciences or pure sciences, but this is absolutely true of English studies. In English studies, it is imperative, it is uh, essential that you understand that this simple fact of life, that research scholarship cannot be distinguished always from uh, research writing. You know, you know, so that thing you have to bear in mind. You know, so in other words, the practical side of research scholarship is that you are working on your writing skills. You, know. you are making your skills more and more sophisticated and more and more uh, uh, with a greater attention to details. You know. Look, that is the difference between uh, when, a, when a journalist writes and a research scholar writes. You see, look, when journalists write, they write with a certain kind of certain air of generality. There is a certain air of generality when uh, journalists write, you know, they generalize, you know, it is part of their job, you know, but never a research scholar, a research scholar cannot ever generalize, you know, he or she must uh, base their statements on evidence, you know, you have to substantiate uh, your statement with some kind of uh, textual Evidence. You, know, you cannot make vague statements. You cannot indiscriminately attribute motives to characters, uh, or you cannot just impose your own thoughts on a text. You know, on a, on the text that you're studying. You know, or even if you're studying, uh, uh, or if you're examining at a certain kind of data. You know. That is why research. Uh, is the pursuit of truth. Man. You will give your perspective. Look, man, remember two things. Uh, one is your own uh, perspective. I'll tell you what we mean by that. Uh, perspective plus truth, man. You can always say, uh, how do how can they go together? You know, How can I have my own perspective? And how do I know if it is a truth that is accepted by everyone else. Look, uh, this this is not a new problem. You know, this is an old problem. I mean, countless people have thought about this problem. So you won't be the first one in history to be thinking about this. In fact, the great, the eminent Buddhist philosopher Nagarjuna and uh, Dignaga also thought about this problem. Uh, Komarila Bhatta thought about this problem. Shankaracharya thought about this problem, and Mandana Sharma also thought about this problem before Shankaracharya. So it's a really old problem, and Western philosophers have thought Plato, Socrates, uh, Saint Augustine, and everybody else has thought about this. You know, you know. So, so really, really, you don't have to stress and strain yourself. But the thing is, when you give your own perspective, uh, you are also uh, looking at to what extent this perspective is rooted in uh, facts. You know, you know, you know, you know. Look, uh, this extremely relativist kind of argument that uh, my truth is as good as yours. If I look at a horse and I perceive it as a dog, uh, it becomes a dog. Look, man, it doesn't work like that, you know, no, 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 no. I mean, you have to understand that uh, as much as we like to think that uh, uh, all truth is subjective, it is not, you know. If really all truth were sub was subjective, uh, then uh, even the basic minimal communication would be uh, fundamentally impossible, you know. We communicate... Uh, because we believe that uh, there is something called a fact and we are able to share our thoughts uh, based on those facts, you know, you know, you know facts of the matter. You know, you know. Look, when Newton thought that the universe was infinite, you know, 
and a uh, couple of centuries later uh, einstein uh, disproved newton's uh, contention and uh, he said that no 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 the universe is not infinite but it is very much finite it is expanding it is relative you know and you know his famous uh, theory of relativity is all about that you know and at this point in time we accept that uh, here you know, I, uh, einstein's argument is correct you know for a couple of hundred of years we actually strongly believed that newton was right you know so therefore we cannot say therefore that uh, newton's perspective is only a perspective it was it wasn't the truth and einstein said what einstein said is true and we have to completely uh, throw newton out you know, you know, you know, you know. newton what newton produced was certainly the truth but the truth based on how much knowledge was possible for him at that point in time likewise with einstein you know. maybe 100 years later he will come back to the same argument and somebody will make the point that uh, uh, einstein was wrong and the newton uh, that the universe is actually expanding in fact i in fact don't forget man there is a multiverse theory also now you know that there are more than one universes and and other argument made by this uh, very famous nobel prize winner sir roger penrose that uh, we are a product of a universe that has uh, uh, come to an end and once this re this universe reaches its final state uh, i don't know how many trillions of years from now it will eventually happen and it will go back and it will become that subatomic particle once again and once again that subatomic particle is going to explode and uh, there will be a another universe will come into existence look uh, merely to say that uh, i am not going to live so long therefore this theory is nonsense is not the way we refute an argument you know we have to either way even when we think that truth is relative when we make statements we have to ensure that we are doing it based on all the available facts at our disposal you know which is why literature review is such an important thing in research you know we absolutely take it very very seriously you know so that thing you have to remember that one thing is that literary research writing in english studies Uh, across the board you know whether you are doing uh, language teaching or linguistics or uh, proper literary studies uh, across the board uh, research is about uh, throwing light you know, on the existing body of knowledge you know that you'll be throwing light on you know. we cannot uh, uh, ignore that part you know which is why how you throw light Uh, interestingly is uh, intertwined with how you write you know that's why i keep saying that research uh, uh, researching in english studies is research writing you know so your writing is extremely important man you know look i sent you this i sent you the title of this book i mean it's i cannot say it's a, a concise guide to writing a thesis or dissertation i mean it may not be the best book on the subject but uh, it's a fairly good book man it will give you at least an idea you know what you should do and how you should do you know you see but uh, uh, take the writing part very 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 seriously man. because look Uh, look the point is look i am not uh, one of those people who thinks that uh, uh, who says that you have to be grammatically correct everywhere and uh, there shouldn't be any typos and all these things are inevitable you know in any writing trust me you know, you know although i am a professor of english eh, when i send uh, articles uh, to journals uh, i get 
plenty of uh, corrections you know trust me when i say that you know and literally i have to sometimes revise the entire paper from the title until the end you know so if that is my situation uh, after teaching for more than 2 to 3 decades huh? so definitely uh, uh, you can be sure that uh, you'll have the same issues you know, you know so we cannot be perfect with writing you know we cannot be error free we cannot be grammatically correct always and uh, we cannot be uh, writing in a way that is uh, absolutely clear to everyone you know these things don't happen uh, magically you know but i remember a colleague of mine a rather good teacher uh, uh, what he would do is he would make uh, students uh, come up with a paragraph you know a paragraph or two and he would revise the same paragraph four five six drafts of the paragraphs he would constantly revise the paragraphs and show the student where he or she was wrong and i would suggest you know that uh, uh, that you you should do something like you know, you know write a paragraph keep revising it take two days time let it hibernate come back to it again see you know get the feel of uh, uh, what it is all about rewrite it again rewrite it third time rewrite it fourth time rewrite it fifth time until you feel you are fully satisfied or share it with your friends share it with your teacher with your guide whoever let them correct it just a paragraph you know begin with a paragraph you know is it, is it? and constantly uh, work on your writing you know is it? Is it? only two things matter reading and writing you know so you read 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 and you write on a daily basis at least one paragraph you know otherwise it really makes no sense to talk about research or research methods or research methodology it is writing you know trust me when i say that you know i'll give you examples don't worry you know for you to comprehend what i mean you know that you have to constantly allow your mind uh, to go through the same thing again and again and again you know because look man the subtlety i mean that caution that carefulness with which you use words will become apparent to you after a point in time journalists uh, uh, and some of these people some of these other uh, creative writers and not creative writers uh, but writers in certain other professions uh, do not have to um, take the trouble um, of making uh, mistakes when they write you know but for a research scholar Uh, it's an imposition it's a compulsion it's mandatory that your thoughts should be clear look we can correct the grammar we can correct the typos but if your thoughts are not clear how do we correct how do how does someone correct you how does your guide correct you if your thoughts if you have presented your thoughts in a vague manner that nobody understands you know it's impossible you know that won't work that way the clarity of your thoughts will become apparent when you start writing you know look uh, i'm i'm reading this um, very very popular very famous uh, uh, italian poet you know, of course in english you know uh, i'll give you his name he was also a very great film maker uh, but of course you know, i mean and i'll give one more example uh, uh, george hardy who was a stand up comedian you know one is a poet and film maker and the second one is a american stand up comedian and uh, i have written a paper of the second the stand up comedian and and for a lot of my research i have used pasolini you know. i have used his ideas and i have quoted him extensively you know in most of my work and 
look man the thing is you have to understand that uh, both of them might have nothing to do with research you know uh, in the sense that we understand research you know i mean what uh, what uh, you might assume what can a stand up comedian uh do for research you know for research in english studies you know but it doesn't work that way you see in other words what i'm broadly uh, indicating is that your source material can be from anywhere and everywhere you know you can work on anything under the sun you know it's an extremely broad area you know the spectrum is wide and the choices are infinite you know you really really have a lot of uh, options you know at your disposal you know if you really want to uh, do something that has not been done earlier you know your researching you can always have so much uh, to think and to talk about and to write about man that's very very important man you know that look when i say uh, research writing i am talking about precision man absolute precision your language has to be precise you know, extremely precise and extremely correct to the point where it is irritating to your readers you know that with every point you make you are substantiating your uh, statements with the uh, facts and you are enlightening the reader on how difficult uh, is the search for truth you know you are uh, you are making the um, reader realize how difficult it is you know is it? we call that we call that effort i mean we use this word prob sorry man i spelt it wrongly problematizing you know remove the p we are problematizing something you know you know we are problematizing an issue you know so the problematizing is very very important man and that happens with the writing with how you write how you read something how you explore something and what you what new thoughts you are going to bring what new perspective you are going to bring uh, which will add to the pursuit of truth you know look you may not uh, find out the truth you know you won't get the whole truth you cannot get the absolute truth you know newton could not do it uh, einstein partially did it there's no reason to believe that we are able to do it you know it's always relative it's always perspective based it's always partial but to the extent that you have certain facts at your disposal you will be able to achieve it you know so that thing man how you phrase uh, how you phrase uh, a certain argument how you what kind of words you will use your vocabulary yeah. and all those things are really really important man you know so please my sincere advice man don't dwell too much on uh, is this theory is this not theory is on forcing yourself to use complicated sentences that usually mean nothing or by giving summaries about writers lives look man you have to give some information Uh, on on the writer that you are working you know but uh, i always have the internet uh, to find out about that writer or about uh, that particular subject that you are working on you know i don't need to read it through the uh, research you know through your uh, dissertation you know through your thesis you know you can make reference to it you know you can make reference So what is happening in the book? You know, you know. Look, sometimes we add certain information. You know, like uh, uh, I was working on a paper, and I felt that a certain book was important. You know, uh, so 
I in the footnote I mentioned, you know, that this book deals with this subject in extensively, you know, and it is worth taking a look at, you know. You know. Mm -hmm. So though I had uh, uh, some of the ideas, uh, I mean, I could, uh, uh, I was using for my argument. Uh, I did not quote from that book. So merely so that the reader knows that this book is important and it exists, I added it. You know, you know, I added it as a footnote. You know, so look, when you say works cited, it's only the books that you have read and the articles that you have read. Please kindly don't put everything you know, you know, that you heard of and uh, that you thought about. You know, you know. My suggestion is even with bibliography, I think you should usually have only the stuff that you have gone through. You know. Of course, man, uh, uh, you can always refer to something uh, that you have looked at but have not uh, quoted in your thesis in the end notes or the footnotes. You know. But work cited or bibliography or references, usually it means that uh, you are, uh, uh, the assumption is that you have gone through that and you're quoting from it. You know. But of course, these things vary, so don't worry too much about it. Focus instead on how you will introduce a subject, you know, what your introduction will be, what your literature review will be like, and uh, what are the methods of your data collection, and how do you interpret this data? You know, you know, you know, what are the approaches that you will use? What are the research methods that you will use? And what are, what are the methodologies that you will apply you know, you know, for your uh, this, you know, for your research? You know, you know, you know. You see? But you have to keep in mind, man, you know, that unless you take uh, it seriously, that uh, that whatever you're going to say is not really about uh, being uh, uh, original, but uh, more about uh, one second, but more about adding your perspective, you know, giving a certain perspective. You know. But these things, man, look, man, look, uh, I'll only give you an example uh, for a thesis review that I had done. And uh, the I thought the student did an excellent job. Uh, she covered up the, she was working on a writer and she did a fairly good job, you know, you know, you know a really good job, you know, you know, you know. I mean, she interpreted the text and all. Uh, however, one of the um, reports, I was a Viva examiner, so I was looking at the reports, and one of the reports kind of uh, asked questions about uh, things like uh, what uh, kind of uh, uh, personal view the student has on this particular subject. Mm -hmm. What are his or her politics, uh, uh, and whether they subscribe to a certain idea about uh, political correctness and stuff like that. But look, uh, that was a foreign examiner. And look, and one thing you have to understand that um, personally, I do not think uh, those questions are important. I did not want to impose those questions on the student as an external examiner. Because I really did not think uh, that's the right kind of question. Those are the right kinds of questions. You mean. Look, you can have your own political views, your own intellectual views, your own thoughts on a subject. But uh, as far as your writing, your research writing, and your thesis is concerned, you have to be objective. In other words, you have to go by the facts you have to go by textual evidence and you cannot blindly impose your own uh, methodology without uh, substantiating it with sufficient evidence. The facts have to confirm whatever you're saying. Look, we read uh, in Shakespeare's Tempest, there's a character called uh, 
uh, Caliban, I'm sure most of you are familiar with him. Uh, it's a very, very powerful character, you know. I mean, you know, I'll one bit. Uh, and probably, and it's a, it's a very, very, it's a studied play. You know? I mean, a lot of studies have been done uh, on this play, you know. You know, you know I mean, uh, I mean, I'm sure you know that. Uh, the the studies uh, one media and that the studies are very very popular and uh, and there I an extensively quoted also you know but the point is look man one thing I'll give you how the methodology thing works you know see I mean uh, without knowing the theory of uh, uh, post-colonialism, you know, you know. and uh, interestingly, Shakespeare is creating a uh, post-colonial character. You know, you know. Look at this. I'm quoting uh, Caliban, who is a very, very post-colonial character. You know, let me tell you. you know. Once again, there's something else he says. Uh, see, he's, this is the language of resistance, language of protest, you know. And he says, this island is mine by Sakurax, my mother, which thou takest from me when thou camest first. Thou strokedst stroke me and madest much of me, would give me water with berries in it and teach me how to name the bigger light and how the less that burn by day and night. And then allowed thee and showed thee all the qualities of the isle. The fresh springs, brine pits, barren place and fertile. Cursed be I that did so. All the charms of psychorex, toads, beetles, bats light on you. For I am all the subjects that you have, which first was mine king, mine own king. And here you stay me this hard rock. While you do keep me, keep from me the rest of the island. Look, and you have to understand, you know, what uh, that protest is all about. You know, and uh, uh, that Caliban understand that, uh, like all colonizers, uh, uh, the white English colonizers came to uh, these non-Western parts of the world, uh, or whatever we call post-colonial countries today. And uh, this is exactly how they entered them and made them their own countries. You know, this is, this is how colonialism functioned you know, and and his language is very anti-colonial or post-colonial you know look he says you taught me language he's telling prospero you know he's he's a master you know and my profit on it is i know how to curse you know. the red plague read you for learning me your language you know so he's cursing prospero for teaching him uh, for teaching him English. Basically, he's cursing Prospero for learning English. That learning English uh, uh, is a curse. The only thing he can do with the English language is to curse his oppressors. That is, he can only curse his oppressors. Yeah, he can curse his colonizers. Because they have taken away his land, his resources, everything. And all that they gave him is language. You know. And what will he do with the language? You know? He has lost his country. You know. But look, man, it makes sense to do a post-colonial reading of uh, Shakespeare because the text is supporting your argument. You know. In the very text, you can see characters saying it. You know. The text, the character is clearly stating, you know, that uh, I have been colonized. You know, it goes absolutely with the perspective of the methodology that you want to use, you know, to study the text. Look, man, I'm not saying it does not have to be a one-to-one -one basis. You know, I'll tell you a very beautiful research done on the subject. I'll just know, I'll tell you the name of this man. I'll give you the name. One second one. 
This is a very good book and a very fascinating one. And I'll tell you why it is important also for researchers, you know. You know. What? This is the poetics of imperialism, translation and colonization from the tempest to Tarzan. You know, you know. And uh, the uh, the writer Eric Chaff, it's extremely great scholar. Right? And uh, what he's doing is he's trying to show how in the beginning, exactly the way Caliban is talking, you know, is, the white man entered America, or whatever we call the North America today, and entered those spaces and learned everything from the uh, Native American or the Native Indian, you know, as they used to be called, from the natives, you know, as you say, and used used that knowledge for survival, and later on enslaved that very uh, person, you know, though that very group of people from whom they learnt everything. You know. Of course, you know the word for it, right? Settler colonialism, it's called, man. You know, as you say. That basically most of uh, 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 wherever Europeans colonized outside Europe is all settler colonialism. Australia, Canada, uh, United States, New Zealand. This that's all settler colonialism where they go and settle down there. You know. So this is the book examines it very very carefully and uh, actually goes through those documents, through that historical documents, where the native Indian chiefs uh, and the white uh, European colonizers uh, uh, were, uh, were working together, you know, those agreements. You know. Interestingly, Chaffetz points out that the native Indian Indians, or whatever you call Native Americans, uh, they did not have a concept of ownership of land, you know. So when they were given a document uh, which they were asked to sign, stating that uh, uh, that they are giving away the ownership of their land to this white settler, they did not have an idea that actually they are giving away their land because they don't have a concept called ownership among them. And Chaffetz, Eric Chaffetz, shows that in that translation, there is a miscommunication. The white person, the white European colonizer knows exactly what he's asking for. But the native Indian sheep does not know that he's give, he or she, they are giving away their lands. You know, that their lands are going away, you know, for good. You know. And that is how uh, there was a legal justification for the colonization. The colonization became legally justified uh, in European courts. And uh, it unfortunately uh, it unfortunately meant uh, loss of their land. They ended up uh, 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 becoming uh, outsiders, you know. They ended up becoming uh, minority and they ended up getting killed, you know. Basically, a genocide was committed and millions of Indians were butchered, you know, just like that. You know. But Chaffetz is examining, as a researcher, he's examining the documentation, that kind of transaction that took place. It's an unequal transaction, you know. I mean, we can uh, dismiss it as calling it deceit or cheating, you know. But you have to remember, man, there's a legal backing to that whole enterprise. Don't forget, man, that's how Robert Clive uh, could take over uh, India, you know. At least beginning at the, in the in the early stage of colonialism before the British crown took it over, you know, that's how East India Company would do it. You know. Everything was done 
on the paper to look legally correct. Because they were subjects of British law at the end of the day. Uh, so that thing you have to remember, man, you know, you see, as researcher Chaffetz examines those documents and provides substantial evidence to say that the white colonizer is not different from Prospero in Shakespeare's uh, The Tempest and Tarzan of the Apes. You know, he uses this example of Tarzan in the modern context, 20th century, to say Tarzan is doing exactly something like that. He's going into these lands... Uh, these non-Western countries and uh, as a white man, he's trying to show that he's a white liberal man and he's trying to say that uh, uh, he's coming to save them you know, basically and the very man that is oppressing these people is also coming out to save them by becoming one of them kind of thing you know, you know, you know. and see if it shows you know, that American foreign policy uh, in the third world is not very different from uh, from uh, Tarzan of the Apes in you know, one meter. That is the first. It's a wonderful, it's really, really a wonderful book. You know, it's one of those books that really uh, change my mind, you know, you know. I mean, the research is like amazing, you know. That's the first chapter, Tarzan of the Apes, colon, US foreign policy in the 20th century. Okay, man, just a side line. Uh, when you write your thesis chapter headings, uh, kindly, please, you know, you have to have two headings, man. I mean, one heading one part of two parts to the heading man one part will give a broad idea and second part is more specific you know please don't write one word two words you know, settler colonialism for example that's not a title of a thesis chapter you know. seriously in any area of knowledge you have to have two parts to your title you know. one part will give a general description and the uh, other one is a more specific, you know. I'll give you one more example. One second. Okay, man. One second. See this title, A Rarity Most Beloved. It's a quotation. It's taken, then it puts a colon, Shakespeare and the idea of tragedy. I mean, he's, that is from King Lear, you know. It's a brilliant essay. I'll tell you why it's a brilliant essay. You know, you know. Look, this is the way you frame a thesis title, a uh, chapter title. Man. Look, research works are different from monographs and uh, published work. Man. Look, when you're publishing your work, mm, then you have to go by different guidelines. You know. Because published research... Uh, is a different uh, ball game altogether. You know. There you have to really revise everything and make it look like a proper book. You know. Or even if it's a monograph, uh, a shorter version, if you want to publish your thesis as a monograph, that also you have to, uh, you can make some differences. You know. But a proper research work, you have a lot of liberty to experiment. You know. And that is the whole point. You know. I mean, uh, you you are you have to be most loyal to your own self, you know. and you have to um, acknowledge your sources you know, everywhere. You know. And the argument when I talk about sources, it can be anything from anywhere, man. You know. you can use anything as your source. You can use a YouTube uh, uh, something on YouTube. You can use a WhatsApp chat. Uh, you can use uh, uh, something from the media, a popular account in media. You can use a film you know, and stuff like that. Man. And look, man, uh, as a rule, I mean, often, I won't say as a rule, often I like to use uh, something from popular culture. In, 
पॉपुलर राइटिंग और पॉपुलर कल्चर और अ पॉपुलर मूवी टाइटल इन फैक्ट फॉर वन ऑफ माई पेपर आई वॉज टॉकिंग अबाउट वर्ल्ड लिटरेचर एंड आई यूज दिस बट आई पुट इट इन कोर्ट ऑफ कोर्स नहीं I'll tell you why I thought that was important to you. The world is not here. That's a James Bond movie. One second. I forgot the this one minute. I'll tell you that one minute. One one second. I'll give you the title. Okay, man. This is that's a James Bond movie I use. But of course, man. Here I put the world in quotation marks, you know, huh? because I'm talking about world. world writing world literature this was a conference on world literature you know, so, so, so. and my emphasis was on the world you know, so. whether the world is in a whether the word world is in a film you know. but of course man this is a i'll tell you when this is a 1999 james bond film man you know. Uh, sir i think this one is your titles you are talking about this sorry ma'am disembodied locals of global writing no no both of them together are the title ma'am yeah. i use both of them together okay sir the first part is uh, the more general kind of a thing the second part is more specific i mean that's the, the total title is both of them you know the two parts of the same title you know this is but the, i took that phrase the world is not enough from the james bond movie you know, is, 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 uh, and but of course man, my emphasis was on world whether this uh, world literary the word world in world literature is still relevant you know you know when we if we ignore the locals you know, is, 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 are locals and localities part of the same world or not you know that kind of a thing you know that was my argument you know is, 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 sorry sorry man let me give you the, okay man okay well, december local okay so same thing okay man so that's the point man you know that uh, sometimes you can use uh, you can play with these things you can explore and be creative you know, you know, you know, you know. i mean you can uh, use your own uh, experience you know, you know your own uh, uh, i mean ideas and play around a bit you know you don't have to be um, a stickler for a certain kind of thinking you know you can be you can go easy on those things you know but of course man sometimes the problem is um, unfortunately the case is that sometimes uh, your supervisor might not have the same idea as you do but when you're exploring with writing uh, i think that uh, most supervisors would be uh, accommodating in or should be accommodating at least in in that thing is very very important man in of course when we make general distinction like i'm quoting this is a quotation actually when we talk about uh, uh, research skills and uh, one second research methods which are concerned with how you carry out research and and they vary man look man always remember there is no uh, standard definition of uh, 
research methods and methodologies, they vary with the individual subjects. I'll tell you how they vary. But in all of them, what is the common theme is precision. Your precise use of language. You know, your use of language should aim at precision. Look, man, that is part of don't ferment. When we uh, uh, telling the truth and and exactness always go together. You know. That's what you aim as a researcher. You know. You're being exact. You know. You're being precise. You know. You don't have to be clever. You don't have to use complicated sentences. Trust me, all that is out of all that is out of fashion. Please don't use long, meaningless sentences that nobody understands and nobody is interested in reading. Also, people are more interested in how you present an argument, how you present your thoughts. You don't have to appear clever. You don't have to be brilliant with your work. Nothing. Sometimes it's only one simple idea that you're exploring. Like Eric Chaffetz does. That book is only an exploration of one simple idea. In that that whole translation process was wrong. In that what white European colonizers spoke in one language. Because in their country, you can own land legally. But the person that they were talking to, um, whose lands they were appropriating, had no idea that land can be owned. You know, land was communally owned in those cultures, you know, and that the native Indians were deceived. You know, basically, they were cheated, and they were uh, illegally uh, subordinated. So that whole thing is illegal. That whole colonial enterprise is illegal. That is the argument. Uh, that uh, Chaffetz makes you know, that colonialism is rooted in illegality and fraud. You know. It is merely not about some other conqueror coming here and occupying your country. You know. It is somebody deceiving you and illegally occupying it. You know. So that thing you have to understand. Man. This, the legalities are very, very important are very important when uh, Chaffetz was studying the whole thing. Uh, but of course, he's quoting from Tempest. You know. The whole argument that Caliban makes in two lines, uh, where he says that you gave me language, but that language is only useful for me to curse you, you know, because you have deceived me. In the beginning, you have took everything, all the knowledge that I had about this land. You learned to survive on my land. And then now you are trying to destroy me and kick me out of my own land and make me a slave in my own land. You know. That basic argument, he quotes Caliban and he's showing that how Prospero was a colonizer, Tarzan of the Apes is exactly the same. And both of them are connected, connected to the American foreign policy uh -huh. in the third world, in the 20th century. So that is the thing, man. that's how research is done. You have to give, and he gives, he goes in very deep into the documentation part. I mean, it took many years to do that research, but Almost every line you can see he's substantiating with some textual uh, evidence. Man, he's not making a random vague statement uh, like uh, people do. You know, sometimes. You know. So you have to remember, man. There's a difference between a politician and an intellectual. A politician or a diplomat, they don't have to. I mean, they should. Ideally, they should. In real life, they don't have to care for the truth. You know. mm. But for an intellectual, truth is extremely important. Right? The pursuit of truth. You know. mm. And much of it will be seen in how you write. You know. That's my whole point. That is why I keep saying, you have to learn to write. You have to learn how to frame a chapter title. You have to learn how to introduce a subject. You have to. You can use popular culture. Uh, you can use... Uh, uh, a WhatsApp chat, you can use a conversation because the MLA, for example, you know, has accommodates all of those things in work cited, you know, in bibliography. Any of that you can use. You can use an email conversation discussion and you can attach it somewhere. You can give an appendix of the email in your appendix, appendixes. Uh, you can attach it to your thesis. 
things like that, man. You, 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 you can quote a song, a popular song, you know, and stuff like that, man. You know, anything you can open your discussion using uh, from taking from uh, different uh, areas of knowledge that you are aware of. You know. And once you do that, uh, you make the reader comfortable, you know, it makes it more readable. You know. And that's the thing, please bear in mind, man, you know, when you're writing something, it should also be readable. You know. And again, I keep telling you, man, look, when you can correct your grammar uh, and you might be able to remove the typos, you know, because now there are many tools online that do that. You know. But it doesn't mean you'll be adding any fresh thoughts to the subject, you know. And I'm talking of, I mean, I have done probably innumerable innumerable theses I have reviewed. You know. And usually uh, they are not bad theses. You know. They come, they have done, the student has done some work and the supervisor also has gone through extensively and stuff like that. But rarely do I come across a thesis where I thought the student was the research scholar was adding something new to the subject. You see? Look, because you're not a critic, man. You're a scholar. You know? Critique will give... Uh, critics are empathetic in the sense that they evaluate a text. You know? Your job is not to evaluate, you know, to more to appreciate the context, you know. You know, give a history uh, of that particular uh, word, particular thought, particular idea, provide it a context by giving the right kind of literature review, and add a new perspective, a new interpretation to the data at your disposal. You know. That is your job as a research writer. You know, you know, you know, you know. And that is what you should be focused on. You know, you know. Don't aim too high, don't go too low, you know. Hmm? You have to be somewhere in between. You know? you see? So, please, man, focus on your language, you know. Please don't worry about those stupid distinctions that what kind of theory I will use or my thesis is not theoretical enough. Uh, I mean, uh, some of those are completely relevant. Man. The best thesis I have written had nothing to do with theory. Merely they were written well and the uh, researcher gave a fresh perspective. You know, you know, it's as simple as that. You know. What is it that you will bring as a researcher to the subject? You know. Therefore, man, please, you know, a couple of things. Remember. It's unfair to ask your supervisor to select a topic for you. You won't tell your supervisor to select... Uh, a partner for you, right? So why should the supervisor select a topic for you? You select the topic, you come up with the uh, uh, tentative title, you come up with the abstract, you come up with the work cited, then show it to your supervisor and ask him or her what they think about it. You know, you know. Mm -hmm. supervisors can only guide your thoughts. You know. To see if you're going in the right direction. But the rest of it is your own work. You have to give new inputs and you have to keep working, 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 revising the same draft again and again. Because, uh, look, uh, we were students in the late 80s. Uh, Sharda and me, we went to the same uh, university you know, to do our, to pursue our MA. And we wrote our papers, you know, in pen and paper, usually. That was how we submitted assignments and stuff like that. But uh, we did not imagine that there was, uh, we could not even imagine that there was something called internet uh, that could provide so much uh, information. And whatever little information we had, we usually got it from the library. You know. And to be fair, we did not think literature review was that important, you know. We didn't think, you know. But of course, when we were only doing our masters, so uh, it was very restrictive in that sense. You know. But now, 
everything is interdisciplinary man i mean there is nothing like uh literature that is just literature uh and literature that is not interdisciplinary i'll give you an example this is a, this is a very very beautiful book when i'm quoting from the book's name is i'll give you the name also uh, it's a very well written book i mean i must say that what uh, let me give the quotation first and i'll give you the name of the book this is um, This is feminist methodology, challenges and choices. Man, Caroline Ramazanolu and with Janet Holland. So, I mean, the only please, if you can get access, just read the introduction chapter. You can see what writing is all about. How precise, you know, the level of precision and the level of exactness. That is what you should aim at, man. You see, like simple man. When, for example, they define. This is for example, we discuss feminist methodology with reference to social research on gendered lives. Rather than say women, sex versus gender, or sexual difference, we take gender to include and see how broad it is: sexuality and reproduction, sexual difference, embodiment, the social construction of male, female, intersexual, other, masculinity and femininity, ideas, discourses, practices, subjectivities, and social relationships. Well, gender can be analyzed uh, from differing perspectives and with differing assumptions. We argue that feminist knowledge of gender should include practical social investigation of gendered lives, experiences. relationships and inequalities we see the investigation of the similarities and differences across the diversity of gendered lives as a potentially radical and emancipatory project that the term gender can can serve you know in fact let me tell you man i mean you know they are including just personal relationships also in this is i mean there is this uh, uh, french philosopher man in in British philosopher, man. Sorry, I'll give you his name. He's the there a lot on. I've... Sorry, guys, I can't think of his name now. But anyway, you know, I mean, uh, uh, he does a lot on YouTube. He gives a lot of YouTube presentations and all. Most of them very good, and he ha he says somewhere that uh, we should have a department of personal relationships, you know, you know, something like that along those lines. You know. And immediately when I heard him speak, the semester that followed, I did a course on uh, personal relationships uh, in uh, some of the plays of Shakespeare, you know. You know. i realized that it was important you know and we explored the whole concept of how personal relationships operate in shakespeare's plays you know and of course when anyway, all of shakespeare is about personal relationships only you know interpersonal relationships how people uh, affect each other you know so anyway you know so look at that kind of precision that kind of exactness has to be there when you know you know it only comes when you read a lot and when you're writing on a daily basis and that is what you should uh, focus on guys you know please don't worry too much about definitions uh, and you don't have to go about talking about uh, uh, whether you your how closely your definition of research methodology uh, matches uh, uh, popular uh, Uh, opinions on the same subject and stuff like that you mean i mean you should be more focused on uh, what your own thoughts are and how you are able to define these things you know based on your uh, research you know in other words your research has to throw light on the kind of methodology that you are using but like i told you man everything is interdisciplinary now everything 
I mean, literature students study films, they study song lyrics. Somebody had written a whole thesis on lyrics. You know, you know, don't forget, great uh, uh, Telugu lyricists uh, uh, like Arudra, Atriya, they are all, they are poets. You know. They are great poets also. You know. They are highly respected. Sahir Ludhiyanvi, for example, Majru Sultan Puri, who is a composer. Uh, Sahir Ludhiyanvi is probably one of the great Indian poets. You know. He has written so many songs. And he personally was a, a socialist and a communist, very progressive. So we have to understand man, that nothing, no area of knowledge is uh, bounded by fences. You know? It doesn't work that way. Knowledge is interdisciplinary. Whether you're working in, uh, uh, in literary studies or you're studying linguistics or you're studying uh, uh, English language teaching or English as a foreign language. Somewhere you have to understand that you are dealing with uh, uh, human situations, social situations, uh, and you have to examine uh, based on uh, what that subject is going to teach you. You have to look at what you are going to apply and to what extent your uh, the application of your methods is going to change by the time you come to the end of your thesis. You know. yeah. To be honest, man, you know, in my experience as a research supervisor, I always noticed that the student, the kind of generalization students make at the beginning of their coursework or beginning of their research, they completely change by the time they come to the third year, second or third year. What has changed is not just uh, the reading and the writing, uh, but also their own perspective, uh, which is altered by the way they interact with the uh, subject that they are doing, with what they are reading, you know, what they are doing, you know, with the practical part of the research. You know. It is going to alter your perspective and enable you to um, provide, uh, throw light, you know. So in other words, it is not you changing the research, it is also how the research will change you. How it will improve your writing skills. Mm -hmm. The ability to use simple language, uh, the ability to uh, frame thoughts, deep thoughts, complex thoughts, using very simple language, is very, very important, man. You know, To be honest, I'm reading a very great uh, uh, Spanish uh, I'm reading a great uh, Spanish mystic, you know, Teresa of Avila, you know, very, very great woman. You know? And apparently even her Spanish was not very good, you know, you know though she was born and um, raised in Spain. You know? And she did not have formal schooling and stuff like that. But, uh, I mean, the writing is so simple, so powerful, so moving, because... Uh, the experience of life is so deep, man. You know, you know, you know, the perspective she's bringing uh, to the book uh, is so great. You know, you know, you know, you know. So that is very, very important, man. You know, you know, you know, you know. When you're exploring something, you have to give that. You know. If you make a few mistakes, which can be corrected, if you can add, I mean, if you're, some of your grammar is problematic, you can always, in the revisions, you can work on them. But what you cannot work on is if you're not giving any perspective to the subject. If you have no idea, no perspective, it doesn't make sense. It absolutely won't make sense. I mean, somewhere on the internet, you know, you know I mean, I am one of those <laughs> TikTok addicts, you know. And where somebody said that uh, he or she, I think both, you know, in different uh, TikTok videos, that they married themselves, you know, you know, which is fine. Yeah, you know, I'm happy. You know, you know, I mean, if they're happy with being married to themselves, frankly, they can do what they like. And if they're happy, I'm happy to, you know. You know. But uh, when we when we talk about marriage, we usually mean two people, you know, you know, unfortunately or fortunately. Is, 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 
So that kind of thing, man. Look, when you are doing research, it's an interpersonal experience. You cannot say I'm writing this only for myself. You know. The thoughts are clear to me. You know. They don't have to be clear to anyone. I have my own truth. And if you feel that nobody is listening, you just reproduce whatever uh, somebody else has said. And uh, you just think, you know, I don't have to care anymore. You know. I'll just write whatever the teacher wants me to write, the supervisor wants me to write, and let me end there. You know. But the uh, there are inherent problems with that kind of thinking. And even worse, you know, that uh, what impact it will have on your teaching, man. You know. Like teaching, look, man, as teachers, we are always, or teacher aspirants, uh, either way, we are always aiming to uh, improve our own uh, skills, improve our own knowledge, and improve our own writing. You know, you know. It doesn't happen overnight. You, know, you, know, you, know. you see, we have to do those things, man. You know, you know. That, uh, likewise with research, I mean, somewhere we have to keep providing new stuff, new inputs. You know, it is another way of growing. It's it will enable your personal growth and your professional growth as well. You know. Just now, most institutions take these things seriously. You know. I mean, gone are those days when you could be a professor for your entire lifetime merely by being a good teacher. You know. Honestly, there are some very good teachers who have not done any serious research, but who have been brilliant teachers, amazing teachers, and who changed the lives of uh, uh, countless students you know, for many decades. You know. But unfortunately, now it's impossible. Man, you know. I mean, if you want to have a career as a teacher or a researcher, you have to write a lot, you have to publish a lot, and you have to share your knowledge on public platforms. And that is why I think, man, whatever, look, whatever your teacher might think is not really that important. You know, you know, because teachers usually don't like to discourage students. Their own student, they will say positive things. You know. But when you write, when you publish your articles, the editor is not your friend. You know, you know. He or she is not your sister-in-law or brother-in-law. You know. So they will give a honest view um, of what they think about your work. You know, you know. Which is a good thing, you know, in a way, you know, because they are helping you to grow. You know. I'm not saying you should not have an opinion on yourself or that your uh, supervisor's or your friend's opinion is not good enough. It is. You know. But it is wrong uh, for you to embark on research without expecting somebody to criticize you. Please be open to criticism. Don't take it personally. Your writing is not perfect. You are not infallible. You know. Trust me, you know, I mean, I have never submitted a paper without being asked uh, to make numerous corrections I'm talking about. You know. So many corrections that sometimes it takes me one or two years to actually rework on them and send it back to um, publication elsewhere. You know. Sometimes I get offended that I've been asked to correct so much. But in my more cooler moments, I go through all the corrections. I revise. And when the paper is submitted and when it is published, I'm fairly happy you know, that I took the trouble of uh, making those corrections. You know. So you should have an auto-correct one. Continuously correct your writing. Uh, do the grammar check. Do the check for typos. Check whether the words that you are using are exact, whether they are describing the subject correctly, uh, whether your data collection is uh, as honest as possible, whether the interviews, questionnaires that you are using are clearly framed, you know, and whether your sample is big enough. Man. Uh, 10, 20, 25 is not a correct sample. You know. You have to have as large a sample as possible. You know. Look, cephalogists can make a mistake. You know. Look, for example, the other day there were exit polls. Usually, you know, I mean, they made a mistake with Madhya Pradesh, for example. But that is not the fault of the person who's doing the exit poll, man. You know, sometimes your research results may not be accurate, even though you have honestly uh, examined. Uh, 
your sources correctly. So sometimes the anomalies will be there, you know, because this is humanities. In humanities, there is no perfection. You see? Nor is there perfection in science, according to me. Though there might be disagreement, we might have disagreement on the subject. Having said that, you have to take it seriously. You, know? you have to be, uh, you have to reflect what is on the ground. You know? If so many students in a particular college are saying that their English language, uh, that their knowledge of English language is not good enough to get a job because they come from a rural background, your research has to reflect that. You know? And that is honest research. You, know? you cannot merely say that the students are, students are lazy, they don't want to develop themselves. You have to prima facie accept that this is the student's response. You can always interpret it and say that there is a possibility that there is a great amount of distraction uh, within the student community and that they tend to watch, uh, take movies more seriously than they take English language. Okay, man, all those things you can add in addition but you cannot be uh, completely opposed to what uh, the data is given to you, you know, to the given data. You, know. you cannot go opposite to that. You know. mm -hmm. I'll end with only one example, man. I remember years ago, and one of my favorite examples, you know, a boy who, a student of mine, you know, I mean, a good intention guy, you know, I don't mean to criticize him, Quite a clever guy, writes well, thinks well, and all of that. He did a thesis on a particular woman uh, writer, you know. And for some reason, he did not like the woman writer, you know. And the entire thesis was actually a criticism of the writer. You know. And I was furious with him, you know. I said, look, two options you had. One is if you did not like the writer, you didn't have to work uh, on her, you know. Second thing, if you worked on her, you could have kept your prejudice aside and objectively written a thesis on her. How can you write a thesis, entire thesis, trying to prove that she's not a good writer? That is the worst kind of research. Man. Mm -hmm. I warn you never to do that. Nothing can be more discrediting to you as a researcher, research writer, research scholar, and as a human being, as an individual person. It reflects very poorly in do on something, be honest with what materials you're using, examine objectively, see what perspective you can add, think carefully, and your thoughts will come carefully only after you have read a lot carefully. Do a lot of reading, see what other authors are saying, make the habit of, if you like a passage, take a passage and quote it, keep it somewhere, you know, at least make a note somewhere that I could possibly use this particular quotation for my thesis. You may not use it, you may junk it that doesn't matter but you have to do this extensive note taking uh, and you have to ma make a list of quotations uh, list the work cited list the bibliography come up with a tentative title come up with an abstract and then start working on the actual content of your paper because by then your mind has enough clarity don't write the paper first and then start searching for material. You know that is putting the cart before the horse. You do all the other groundwork. When you're reading, take the right quotations, uh, quotes that you are going to include. Make a list whether you are going to include or not out of ten books, twenty books, ten essays, twenty essays, whatever. Make a list of the works cited. Come up with a brief abstract. Mm -hmm. 250, 300 words, 400, 500, whatever, is it? A tentative title. You can modify everything along the way. Mm -hmm. Then you start writing. Begin with very simple kind of introduction, what you think about the subject, what the subject is all about. Mm -hmm. And then start uh, developing your argument. But whatever you say has to be exact, it has to be precise, and it has to be based on substantial uh, textual evidence you see if you're going to make a statement uh, that means i have to know that this statement is already backed by other researchers who have worked on the subject you will give quotes from other researchers who have worked 
and then you are very clearly give a definition like this woman did in like these two women did with the feminist methodology what they mean by gender reunion look they included almost everything under the sun you know very broad kind of definitions very inclusive very accommodative so that way you are up to date and then you develop you keep going point by point give an argument and uh, whatever you want to say is a writer or you can enter a subject and you can tell what that subject is all about in your own words again not plagiarizing not copying not uh, doing that uh, what is that artificial intelligence tool where you give an input and it gives you an output please don't do all of that man it's a very very poor way of uh, it reflects poorly you know don't do all that you know right in your own language if you make mistakes no problem it's not a big deal it, you can always correct them and on a daily basis try to read at least one essay uh one essay is good enough or 15 to 20 pages of a book and write at least a paragraph or two on a daily basis you know and that will slowly build your they'll form they'll be the building block blocks for your research work you know so at this point my my session is very simple man you know i mean you know, once you've done all of that you can come back to the introduction give a definition of research methodology you can argue why it is interdisciplinary why you're looking at different areas of knowledge and you can say why it's intertextual and you can say why this is important uh, the kind of methodology why questionnaires are important and why interviews are important all of that you can always they are not the difficult that's not the difficult part of the research the difficult part of the research is how you find the data and how you interpret the data you know so probably that's the harder part you know how do you get and how can you make sure that your data is as close as possible to the ground reality and what kind of interpretation uh, you think will help you to understand you know will help the reader to understand the subject better you know and don't worry too much about uh, writing in complicated english uh, you can write in simple words use simple present i always use simple present to avoid errors and uh, people can write simply like i gave you the example of uh, teresa of avila you know she writes so simply but so elegantly so convincingly so persuasively and so beautifully you, know, you can imagine uh, like the movie title a beautiful mind you know the mind is reflected in the writing you know yeah. but the person who translated it uh, the translator whose spanish is probably better than hers you know is this says that uh, her spanish was really not that great you know she was like a normal uh, spanish speaker you know but that is the whole point man you know you don't have to be an extraordinarily gifted writer of english you know english language you know just present your thoughts in a way be your own reader you know in a way that is comprehensible you know make sure that whatever you're saying uh, the other person is able to read clearly you know, you know and make it interesting take example from popular culture just to begin just to break the ice you know is 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 and that way you can uh, not only you're helping the uh, uh, helping yourself you're helping somebody else also to grow by reading your work you know, you know. okay guys please think about these things and i want to thank uh, uh, vignan university and the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts on this subject thank you very much thank you thank you very much sir thank you know uh, just 5 to 10 minutes q a session sir if any suggestion for sure sure please sir. please i'm more than happy okay now the platform is open for all the research scholars if at all you want to make any clarifications or any suggestions in your research area just to make a note of that kindly unmute yourself and those who are asking questions unmute yourself and after asking question you vote before that while asking a question introduce yourself to the resource person now open to all thank you thank you
Please admit yourself if you want to ask anyone. Sir, the uh, uh, a scholar has texted me personally. Please, sure, sure, sir. Tell me now. Ask me. The intertextuality of classical Prabandha literature into modern lyrics. A critical film study of 21st century in Telugu literature. Could we make this as a, uh, a research topic for the students? Okay, can you please, if, you, if it doesn't mind, can you put it in the, yeah. message, in the message box, the entire title, and take a look at it? Okay, sir, okay. Look, man, the thing is, anything can be a research topic, you know, provided it has the subject has a potential for research, you know. You see, 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 see. I mean, uh, that is the important part, you know. You know see, 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 see. You see? That uh, how do you think, uh, what kind of potential you think that uh, this subject has for research? What is missing, you know, here? Look, man, imagine two analogies I'll give you. One is... Mother will start just a uh, textuality of Prabhanda classical literature means more uh, classical literary genre, Prabhanda literature. Okay, man. in classical Sanskrit. No, no, man. What you can do is no, no, you can reframe the title, man. Huh? Yeah, uh, elements of Prabhanda classical Prabhanda literature, or do, don't remove the word classical, man. It's unnecessary. Elements of Prabhanda literature. In modern, in film lyrics, film is a modern genre. Don't worry. Okay. Okay. Elements, uh, let me write it down. Only to make it clear. Look, one minute, one minute. Uh, sorry, this probably is closer to the truth, man. You are looking at Prabhanda literature and film literature. Yeah, it's an excellent topic, man. Absolutely, mm -hmm. no doubt about that. Because the scholar came to me by asking that if he has seen Bhakta Kannapa film where Kirat Arjuniyam is a Bharavis, Kirat Arjuniyam is a Prabhanda, hmm. that was framed into only just five to eight minutes of entire lyric. Hmm. Hmm. So, Absolutely, like, man. Hmm. Uh, okay, sir. No, man, look, let us not forget, uh, sir, that uh, uh, translation and comparative literature have taken over the world, you know, you know basically. You know, so, literature in translation is taken as seriously as uh, uh, literature written in English. You know. So, this okay. thing will throw new light, you know, how we look at film lyrics. And uh, what are those elements of Prabhanda literature that film lyricists are Absorbing oh, yeah. and reflecting, you know. Yes, yes, sir. But the translations have to be really good, you know. Let me uh, tell you. you know. Okay, okay, sir. Hmm? Now open to all any other research scholar. Annapurna. Yes, tell me now. You have to unmute yourself. Now it is her. Unmute themselves. The option is given to all. You can unmute yourself and ask any clarifications or any suggestions in your research area. Also, in case you can write in the chat box also, please. You can. Yeah, that's what I suggest that if you feel inconvenient, you can send in the chat box. Good evening, sir. Good evening, good evening, man. Uh, sir, I am Dr. Kanifnath. I am your student also at uh, 
I was in Iflu. Okay, okay, man, okay. <laughs> Uh, SR University right now. <laughs> so it was really indeed uh, uh, again going back and listening to you. Was, thank you, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, this is not a question, but I want your reflection on this. Sure, sure. Uh, like, nowadays, so many other things are there. Like you were talking very uh, nicely about how ideal research should be and how we should be in pursuit of truth. But nowadays, uh, uh, you know, the society or the government or the private sector, they want more research. They want us to produce more, more research. So uh, like chat GBT or some AI tools have been uh, yeah, device, yeah. And uh, so now in this situation, I want your reflection or your opinion that, you know, how, how to deal with such uh, such scenario at, at in the 2023 I want your just very opinion. Good, it's an excellent question, man. Look, man, the thing is, every development in technology is important, man. We have to remember that. Thing, you know. Look, man, uh, there are two schools on that. I'll quickly tell you. One is uh, the, what's his name, man? The culture industry mm-hmm. argument. Who is the author of the culture industry? I forget his name, man. I'm sorry, I'm very poor. I don't know. Hmm? One is the argument that Adorno makes that all uh, these technologies uh, are actually supporting uh, uh, fascism and stuff like that. And he calls it culture industry. But the other school is Raymond Williams. Man, you know, and Raymond Williams says that the Birmingham school, uh, Adorno is the Frankfurt school. And Raymond Williams says that actually every new technology is a welcome development. You know, you know, you know, it's, 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 because it uh, makes life easier for a lot of people, especially the working classes. And uh, look, man, whatever the developments in technology that might take place, because like I told, man, when we were young, typewriter was a very big thing. You know, you know, you know, you know. I mean, uh, we wrote uh, our papers uh, in hand, with hand, you know, you know. And now I cannot even write properly uh, using hand, you know, you know, because uh, I lost touch, you know. So, 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 so. But uh, uh, the moment the computers came, uh, they replaced a lot of typists, you know. So there is a dark side to technology. You know. If artificial intelligence is going to make it big, a lot of people are going to lose their job. I'm sure you know about the protest in Hollywood, you know. You know, you know so, so, so. so, but anyway, but we cannot come, we cannot, we have to incorporate these developments within the broader uh, uh, area of research writing. Man. You see? Which is why I mean, I, my emphasis was on the pragmatic side, the practical side of research, you know, which is writing. You know. I want you to learn how to write you know, while you are doing research. You know. Because that is a weapon, that is a tool that will always help you to grow. You cannot be under the impression that uh, uh, I will use some tool uh, and make sure that uh, I come up with the functional draft and I don't have to develop or I don't have to think. You know, there is no such a tool on earth to substitute thinking. Man, you know. thinking is what, unfortunately or fortunately, we have to do as human beings. You know. <laughs> So those developments are important, man. Like I told you, man, even a WhatsApp chat is important. You know, you know, those tools have radically altered our social and political life. You know, you know. they have altered our personal life. You know, and likewise with artificial intelligence. You know, you know, it was there from 30, 40 years, but now we see more people talking about it. You know, it is basically hard programming. That's all. You know, it's not a very. You know, live we are using a fancy term, artificial intelligence. You know. But whatever it is, you know, don't forget when Microsoft Word did not have spell check, you know, it came much later. It came in the 90s, you know, I remember you know, when I was writing, when I was doing my PhD in 1985, Microsoft uh, Word introduced spell check, you know, you know, you see. And then we didn't have to sit down and correct spellings, you know, automatically it was being done by the uh, tool itself, you know, you know, by the application itself, you know, you see. So these things you have to remember, man. Let us not get confused. Let us not be critical of anything. You know. Technology or developments in technology and developments in society, all those are fine. You can have your own view. I don't know had his view. Raymond Williams had his own view. But your job as a researcher is 
fundamentally very very simple learn to write well guys you know write in a way where you're able to express your thoughts because when you teach don't forget students want to be with the teacher who can talk clearly you know if you can talk perfect english that nobody understands it's not going to help you you know you have to write you have to place an emphasis on communication and your writing should only work on the practical side of it that's all i'm saying you know don't dwell too much on theoretical uh, social and political issues the point is how well you are able to incorporate some of those things into how you write you know you know that is what you should be thinking about you know drafting i always say that when drafting is probably one of the greatest of skills you know i have seen people with almost zero knowledge of grammar wonderful drafting you know when they write a document though there are so many mistakes you cannot believe how good the document is you know i am always impressed by how well they are able to present their thoughts you know So sir, that another, is the thing another, is important by you know sir okay, another is... another scholar from arokia mary okay, she is asking uh, she is asking what should be the sample size in action research for example while doing research on writing skills to the rural degree students super please you know as far as possible make it as big as possible man you know, because uh, if you have the time i mean i'm not the right person to tell you how many what is the correct number yeah, sample but, size uh, correct number of the no, the sample size but make it as broad as possible it should include for example boys <laughs> girls sundar yeah. beta in a particular, uh, in a particular uh, uh, class or in a particular school or particular age group or whatever as many parameters as possible you include you know because that will give an a certain exactness to your research you know, you know, you know, you know, you know. that sample size is very important and the kind of parameters you will use to define that sample you know, to attribute to that sample you know. because only then you will be able to tell exactly whether the students writing skills are weak for lack of exposure or because uh, lack of teaching you know you know don't forget when some in some of the rural areas uh, students have access to mobile phones and they have access to youtube where they can certainly have get a lot of access to uh, english you know english language you know but are they not doing enough you have as a researcher you should be able to tell you know, whether they are not doing enough they are not making enough effort or that they are not getting enough time or because uh, uh, they are not showing interest and if they are not showing interest why they are not showing interest everything has to be substantiated and evidence based man based on the kind of questionnaire that you will use kind of interviewing you will do uh, you will do and stuff like that you know you know you know, you know whether personal interview or whatever you know, you know, you know and the language you will use to communicate with them you know all those things are very very important but this is so add a lot of parameters you know, mm-hmm. and try to keep the size it's not merely about numbers man look if you're only taking the boys uh, in a school Sir, that's not a correct sample good evening sir good evening good evening so my name is balram gangada from kl university good evening tell me no uh, sir i am working on the post colonial literature sir very good man very good. so i have take up uh, pre- pre- uh, no, previously i have take uh, go with one idea but while i am going on this literature review i keep divert down for example post colonial literature some psychological aspects or some utopian ideology or some feminist post colonialism or absurdism like that Hmm. so how can is it better to go with one thought throughout the thesis or else we can add to to our more ideas in our thesis look reset your your thesis has to be very exact man okay i mean what exactly you aim to do post colonial literature is an ocean man yes sir 
you have to stay you have to restrict yourself to one thought but when you write you can include a lot of things when you, you know, so remember that in the process of writing you can develop and expand uh, to be in, to include a lot of other things you know, in, as part of your argument okay but your thesis has to be focused and your ideas have to be restricted to developing one or two um, thoughts you know, you know, you know, you know. what not which you think are missing in other researches you know when you do literature review you have to tell what is not sufficiently examined in the previous research and yes. then you start giving your own uh, perspective yeah yeah That's thank it. you sir thank you sure thank you sir hello sure. sir. hello 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 tell me no? sir uh, my name is sir arshad hello scholar arshad. in english department vigna university hello arshad so mine is a general question that uh, as a english literature scholar uh, which is more important uh, the criticism or uh, literariness uh, and uh, how does we explore uh, literariness in uh, research that we doing english literature uh, look when uh, critics usually evaluate man that's all i think they give a value to a certain uh, text eh? but look at literariness uh, combines two things man one you are looking at the metaphorical aspect of a text uh, other you are looking at the literal aspect you know no 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 is it but when we talk about literariness we are essentially talking about the language used within the text you know you are talking about literary language you know and what you have to begin by defining what you mean by literary language you know? look for example if i had to define literary language i'll say that all literary language is by definition metaphorical you know? you know that metaphoricity is a feature of literary language we cannot have literary language uh, without metaphors you know? but somebody may counter argue and say that uh, uh, prose prose writing is not always metaphorical you know it uh, looks it uh, relies heavily on literal writing you know, you know, you know, you know on liter- on the literal meaning of words you know, you know, you know, you know. so that is the thing man you know, you know it you have to be very clear on what you mean by what you say you know when you talk about literariness you have to tell me you have to come up with a uh, substantial uh, uh, argument to say what constitutes literariness you know, you know, you know, you know. those things are important man at any point you have to substantiate you have to keep giving more and more parameters to your definition and you have to say why each one matters you know, you know, you know. sir uh, sure sure tell me no uh, my name is amjad sir amjad tell me amjad uh my question is from uh, like one of your sentences actually sure man uh, you mentioned like scholars are not critic uh, it's no, like not, a, no uh, yeah like uh, so my uh, like i just started my uh, research and everything so uh, this workshop is feeling very much into me so i got a little confusion isn't it uh, to uh, good to be a critic sir while uh, we are reading uh, doing our reading uh and itself uh, isn't it uh, good to be a critic uh, critically reading it sir like uh, i'm doing an eco criticism and i'm uh, doing my reading in eco criticism and everything so while doing my reading itself isn't it uh, good to be a critically aware of uh, what i'm um, isn't it good sir like uh, yeah. that's why the confusion very good critical awareness is a good thing man but criticism look man for example if you're going to write a book review then you are a critic you know because to some extent you are evaluating what that whole text is all about but for a research scholar it is very very little of it is your own personal impression you know this is critics can be very impressionistic you know you know for example uh, uh, eliot says that uh, uh, somebody for example i'll give you orwell for example i mean he's very critical of yeats you know wb yeats the poet wb yeats you know he's critical of charles dickens yes and he's a great uh, there's no doubt that he's a very knowledgeable person you know but at the as the critic that those are his own views you know, you know which is fine you know we 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 admire them you know but as a research scholar 
you have to look at the entire context surrounding a statement. So everything you have to you have to be suspicious of concepts. You have to be suspicious of statements made by uh, other writers. Look, suspicion is a bad thing in reality, but it's a good thing in research. You know, okay. it is good to be skeptical. In other words, you have to look at everything with an air of suspicion or an air of skepticism. Very, very important, man. You know, it's, it's, you cannot. Uh, uh, a critic does not have to be suspicious or skeptical, but for research scholar, nobody is a friend. You know, everybody you have to look at within a context. You have to show how these things work. This argument, eco criticism, works in some places. It does not work in some places. And what are what is the importance of eco criticism? Given this context, you understand, man. That politics of suspicion is very very important for a research scholar. Yes, skepticism sir, yes, okay. is a better word, but I don't mind using suspicion of concepts. You know, you have to suspect every concept. And you have to give it a context. You have to show where it works, where it does not work. Its bright side, its weak side, its limitations, its strengths, everything. You know. So the research scholar does not have an obligation to his subject matter. A critic is always don't forget when trying to defend one thing or the other. You know. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Therefore. Research scholars are uh, actually much more serious in their business. Actually, you know, yes, sir. Hmm? Okay, sir. Thank you. You answer my questions. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Now over to Devaki, madam. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, thank you, sir. She, thank you. She will yeah. propose a propose a word of thanks for today's session, and uh, Dr. Sarkar sir will uh, uh, circulate this uh, feedback form in the chat box. And sure. then I request all the participants to give their feedback for this excellent lecture by Professor Thank Kona you, sir. Prakash Thank Garu. You, sir. Thank you, sir. Madam. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful and thought-provoking session. Sir, today we had an opportunity to listen to your thoughts on pursuit of truth, research writing across the borders, and then how research scholars should accept constructive criticism on their writing skills mm. and precision in writing. And this surely be going to encourage us in our future events. On behalf of Department of English, I extend a hearty vote of thanks to our resource person, Professor Prakash Kona Reddy, who spared time from his busiest schedule to grace the occasion. I further extend my heartfelt thanks to Professor Sharda, Madam, head of the department, who is the backbone of this workshop. And I thank the entire team of organizers. And I also thank all the participants. Without you, this wouldn't be possible. My sincere mm -hmm. thanks to all of you. Now, I would like to give the session over to the organizers. Sir, please. Uh, thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam. Thank, thank you, you Professor Kona, sir. Prakash Kona, thank, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank enlightening you, sir. us with your valuable knowledge. Sure, sir. Sure, so, sir. Sure. Uh, huh? Actually, for the participants, uh, thank you for uh, being so patient and uh, listening to that uh, session and make that session successful. Uh, we have shared with you the link, uh, feedback link. Some questions are also given. Please fill this out. And also, uh, our next session, tomorrow's session, the next session is tomorrow. And it would be by Professor uh, B. Tirupati Rao, sir. Uh, he will be uh, talking up uh, talking about uh, paradigm in reading literature so uh, we we shall meet again tomorrow at 6:30 thank you thank you so much have a nice time good night thank you thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir, thank you, sir. good thank night you, sir good night thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you very much prakash Mm-hmm.